Hello, Jeffrey and Sylvia, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good, thank you. So welcome to Screen Time, our daily live interview series with architects all around the world, sponsored by Enscape as part of Virtual Design Festival. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. And first of all, start off with where are you? Where are you calling us from? We're in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is um, Northeast Los Angeles. And it's, what is that, your home or your studio? Are you in, are you in lockdown still, or are you able to get to, to the oh, office? Or do you have a home office? We have a pretty nice setup where we we live less than a mile from our office, so we're we're able to travel between our office and our home. And right now we're in our office. And we are you're in the office. office. Everybody else, um, our employees are all working from home, and we both uh, come to the office and um, take care of anything uh, which needs to be done here. Answer the phone and so on. Yeah. So just the two of you in the office then, is it all the employees are, are at home still? Yes, that's right. Correct. Lots of Zoom. And tell us all day long with our employees. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your architecture practice, standard architecture. Tell us, tell us all about it. How many people are you? What kind of work do you do? How did you start the practice up? Should I start? Yes. Go okay. So, so there's two of us. It's the two partners, Sylvia and, and me. And then we have currently 10 employees from all around the world. Um, some have been, win, been with us for about eight, eight or nine years, and some are you know, one to three years. So it's a mixture of sort of experienced people and some talented young designers. And um, we started here. 20 years ago, um, um, with our first projects were actually, we started with James Purse and his father, uh, um, who owns Maxfield here. So James Purse is a uh, pretty, I think, well-known brand now around the world. And when we started working with him, he was in his early 20s and had no stores and no clothing line yet. And we did this house and his first stores. And from there, um, I think we became known within fashion brands, design stores, started designing their homes. Um, also have an interest in culture and art. So um, we did a few art galleries, competitions. Um, so that's our practice, basically. Homes, retail, competitions, galleries. And I was looking on your website earlier, and you also did some um, homes or um, structures for pets. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a benefit. Um, it's an annual benefit that we've participated in, I think, four years in a row. So we kind of settled on a, a typology of concrete and, and wood, and each year we kind of do a different take on it. It's a cat house. It's concrete cat house houses and they always made out of concrete to absorb heat and then um, we claim teak every year with a different take on how we combine those two. So fashion stores, homes and, and cat houses as well but you also did a collaboration with Dezine a couple of years ago the, when we did the Adidas pod project so tell us a little bit about that collaboration that you did with us. Okay, I go for it. So it was with uh, Adidas and it uh, was called Pod Systems and um, Adidas and Disney invited five architects here in Los Angeles to come up with an idea which um, was uh, basically reflecting the concept of a shoe which was combined out of two different shoes and made one new shoe. So we were supposed to take two ideas in architecture and combine them into something which is better and new. And we, um, I think we, we combine transparency and bolts, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we made this super structures uh, where like the series of bolts floating above a colored landscape. And um, that structure we discovered in the process could be 
put over a garden, but it could also be over an ocean or a stadium or on Mars. So we did all these collages showing them in different landscapes as well as on other planets. <laughs> it was pretty fun. And then uh, you guys came over and interviewed us. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get to go on that trip. I'm looking at the, I'm just looking at the story now that we published in those yes. days. Like standard architect proposes modular mega structure for any any context. So was that yeah. project was that based was that a, a brand new idea that you came up with for the collaboration, or was that one of those ideas that you'd been working on in the background for a while? I think. I think it's part of, um, it is, it's something that's been in the background for a while. And I think you'll see in at least one of the projects we will show today, there's a similar kind of concept, except it's instead of round vaults, it's um, gabled structures. So this idea of um, repeating a structure and then um, cutting holes in it or making it transparent is um, something that we're interested in. And also I think the relationship to landscape and the openness of the landscape around, you'll see in a couple projects too. Okay, well you've, you've queued up your presentation quite nicely there then, so why don't you show us the work in your presentation? Okay, uh, let me share so, the screen. Um, you know, this is um, a selection of current projects, um, some in development, some under construction, and some recently completed. Okay. So, so this first one, um, this, this is the one that kind of goes along with the, the pods project that we just discussed, where it's, it's two um, parallel vaulted structures that um, it's a single family home here in Los Angeles, set in the landscape, and it's um, these two parallel structures. One is completely enclosed living space, and the other one is about, I don't know, 50, 40% enclosed and 60% open. It's this so one. That's the open end of the second structure. So the, the two structures sit side by side and, and this one is the patio for the enclosed one. And it should it's still probably got about a year of construction left or nine months of construction left. But it's, you can see the, how we make full, full size cutouts in the sides of it and mm -hmm. um, it, it'll be very austere. Um, it'll have a corrugated metal roof and very simple uh, finishes. And which part of LA is that in? It's um, in the hills, basically. It's, it's technically Beverly Hills. It happens to be next door to Paul McCartney's house in um, Beverly Hills. Ah. In the mountains right next to Paul McCartney, yes. Nice, nice place. And in the background there, there's like some kind of, is that, a, is that a mountain in the background? But it looks like it's got a digger on top of the, the mountain. It, it does. Um, yes, that is, it must be a development site. We, we looked it up and it's owned by um, the, the embassy of Saudi Arabia. So I don't know, it might be a very large structure going up over there. <laughs> it's going to ruin the view of it. <laughs> Sorry yes. for that. Sorry for that interruption, but I couldn't help noticing the digger on the edge of the cliff. It's true. Okay. Um, now it's a complete house. Uh, sure. Yeah, this, this is a, a remodel, um, a very extensive remodel to a small mid-century house in the Sunset Plaza area of Los Angeles. Um, very um, clean, simple, but uh, great attention to detail where um, every intersection and every, the wood and how it all comes together. You can see with the, the lights up, up here, how everything was kind of uh, dialed in so that it fits together like a kind of a puzzle piece. And it's for a, it's for a local- um, For an Englishman. <laughs> an, English, an English guy, but he's uh, uh, involved in film and, and I think he does a lot of his own um, stunts and things. So this project was built actually as a gym for him. So he, he lives in another house and, and this one, we fitted it out with um, 
special uh, connections in the ceiling and so on. So you can hang um, a pull-up bar, uh, punching bags, rings, and things from, from this very beautiful ceiling when you need to. <laughs> Is this, is this somebody that we know? Is it a famous person? Yeah, it's Jason Statham. Ah, okay. Fast and Furious. So it's, I think it's working out well during the lockdown that he can, he can use it as a gym um, currently. Yeah. I want to see some pictures of him though, doing chin-ups from the, the ceiling. You probably need to go on his Instagram, <laughs> check that out. <laughs> I will, I'll check it out later. Yeah. Um, this is an, another project we just started. It's actually the first, one of the first three images. Um, it's a house in a desert, pioneer town outside. It's like two hours away from Los Angeles um, in the middle of nowhere. Their property is, um, is 50 acres, and this will be one structure in the middle of this rocky, deserty um, site. Really excited about this. And, yeah, and the idea is that you, you approach from the road along kind of a dirt driveway, and then you end up um, in this, it'll be like an outdoor kind of courtyard, and you'll be presented with a wall with a, a doorway in it, and then you'd walk through the doorway and then be presented with the view of the, their massive kind of property and uh, rocks, uh, Joshua trees, sunrises, everything. <laughs> so it's a, like a, we're kind of doing a 270 degree patio um, after you come through this courtyard and all the living spaces would then open up to that patio and the bedrooms would be behind, and this is an art studio for um, one of the two clients. <laughs> do, do. This is um, a, a vinyl record store, which we completed late last year. Uh, it's in Hollywood, and um, the owner um, is, is really interested it just has a he's reti he's retired and he has a passion for collecting vinyl records and it was kind of a labor of love for him to uh he's coming from retail but to open up this retail store um and sell like a curated selection of records and also in the middle you can see that round table um, he also has turntables and the whole store, you can see it was inspired from the shape, the round shape of the records. Uh, the, the soft, these soffits, they curve around that circular table in the background. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to make the records pop because they're so beautiful. So we, everything is black and then these shelves are well lit and what you see is basically just the round shape and the records was the idea. And that's a regular store, is it? It's not someone's home. Whereabouts is that? It's, it's in Hollywood, um, La Brea and uh, Willoughby, which is just south of Santa Monica Boulevard at La Brea. It's really in, the, in between the old studios in Hollywood and it was an industrial site and um, it's in one of those warehouses, a retail store oh, just opened up, yeah. That's a rendering of the, another, another project which is set in the landscape. Um, it's, a, it's basically a ranch. We call it Surf Rider Ranch. It's right, um, it, it's in Malibu, right at the ocean. And um, this is the arrival, behi basically behind the house and you walk through that door and then you have a view over the ocean. And it's a, also very large, site and it has um, you can see here the swimming pool you can see the house in the background and uh, it's a swimming pool also with a view of the ocean and those are the santa monica mountains this is the l largest project that we're currently working on yeah and it's in uh, still going through the coastal commission permitting process 
everything at the uh, at the beach, everything at the ocean in California has strict regulations, um, which okay. are hard to navigate. Uh, but I was it's going to ask you about that when you showed the desert project. How how easy is it to get permission to build in in the desert? And you're talking about the coastline here. In generally in California, can you build wherever you want, um, or is it? pretty challenging. Um, that, that area of the desert is not um, difficult to build in. Um, it's a sort of unincorporated San Bernardino County. And um, once you provide access for fire vehicles and you provide the, the water for firefighting, um, the permitting process is fairly easy for, for this. Maybe it should be more strict <laughs> in, in order to protect the resources. but. Um, it's uh, our, our approach to this project is very environmentally sensitive, and we're we're looking at um, you know the least possible disturbance of, of the site in in how we bring the driveway in and where we position the buildings because even some of the plants that don't look like much are about a thousand you know, they could be seven hundred to a thousand years old. We we um, we met a scientist at the site, and she walked it with us um, and she explained how old those various plants are and they, I mean they're like they're 50 years to 2000 years so um, we basically placed the structure in between we mapped we mapping out every plant there and placing it in between the, the larger ones like yeah. the, this one these can be over a thousand years old wow and what kind of plants are they they're the bigger, like this one is a juniper, California juniper, and this one up here is an oak, oak tree. Most of these lower ones are junipers, but there's junipers, pines, oaks, and Joshua trees. And I heard that Joshua trees, that the, there aren't going to be any more Joshua trees because somehow they, they're not reproducing anymore. Is that, is that the case? I'm, I did hear that the climate change is affecting their um, ability to reproduce. I didn't know that it was so absolute, though. Um, is it something I heard? I wouldn't, I wouldn't I think quote me on that. But. I think it's slowed down. They're still reproducing, but um, I think it's more like uh, something on the horizon people are checking into. Uh, there's a lot of um, climate change effects the, where plants grow in which elevation in California a lot. So it's the drought pushes plants to go higher and higher up in elevation. And then if plant is already very high up in an elevation, this is the high desert. It's a high elevation, 4,000 feet, 1,500 meters, I think. And um, they, yeah. They won't have any place else to yeah, go. There, there's no more. It's already, that's probably why they are concerned about. And in the desert, is that something that you notice year on year, the, the, the change in climate? Is it something that is perceptible to people like you who've been living out there for a while? I, I, I've felt it in Los Angeles itself. I feel like the weather's getting a little bit hotter and drier, but um, the, the desert, I haven't, I think it changes so slowly. I haven't noticed it, even though we go there a couple of times, three, I mean, three or four times a year. I think the desert, the, the, the plants in the desert, um, they were really dried up during the long drought, but the last two winters were wet. And uh, so they all came back to life. But uh, a lot of the pine trees in the mountains, you can drive through the California mountains and you see that, that trees basically quite a lot sprinkled in everywhere. So. Um, and a house like this, does this have to be pretty much off grid? Do you have to generate your own power, um, bring in your own water, or is there infrastructure out there in the desert? No infrastructure. <laughs> it's funny, the, the, the clients are very uh, technical or um, technology savvy, so they've already got um, internet out there. <laughs> but we're going to drill a well, and then that'll supply the water for the site, and it'll be stored on site, and then there'll be photovoltaic power. Um, so essentially, it's 100% off-grid with a well. And, um, 
solar panels and batteries. How do they get the internet then? Through the cell phone network or satellite? They, they erected a, an antenna. Um, the, a group of landowners in that area got together and paid, paid for some kind of um, antenna that receives the microwave signal from, from another tower nearby. And then um, that, the antenna that these landowners installed has a solar power system that, that sort of keeps it going. And is this kind of landscape? It's very small antenna, basically, yeah. with very small solar panels, but it's there, yeah. And is this kind of landscape, is it used for anything or is it completely wild? I mean, does it, is it grazed by animals? Is it used for agriculture, minimal, mineral extraction or anything? Is there any industry there? It, it, it formerly had a mining industry, this area, but I don't know that there's that many active mines anymore and currently you know we met a goat farmer on the road there with his herd of goats and it's an area that attracts some um, people who live in yurts and um they're, they're i think more it's more for people who want to get away from from urban urban life and want to kind of have some solitude i, I think it's very this area is very um sparse uh, it's there's a, a person every maybe 50 acres or 60 acres or something like that. Mm -hmm. it looks completely wild and unused with a few very narrow dirt roads and then you see a little house once in a while nothing and just the desert basically so it's it's still very uh natural original and there's the huge plots there's also a lot of governmentally owned protected lands around there. And there's landowners um, buying huge parcels to protect them privately as well. So it's it's at the end of a it's at the end of a world. <laughs> it's really I nice. Really, so people private private individuals are buying land to keep it natural. Yes. Yes, wow. the artist Ed, Ed Ruscha owns quite a bit of land around there that's un, undeveloped. And um, yeah, and this will basically be the only thing, the, this structure like 1500, 12 to 1500 square feet, that's all which will go there. Um, and we also study to put it as close to the next dirt road as possible so to just up as little as possible of the land and, and keep the rest of it protected. Sounds like the goats would be the biggest problem there then to the, the natural <laughs> landscape. Yes, anyway, they are. <laughs> I've, I've, I've asked you too many questions about the desert. Let's get back to your architecture. Okay, so we were looking at this one and this one is, um, you know, for the finest of outdoor living <laughs> near the ocean <laughs> and oh this is a change this um we also sometimes design furniture pieces and this is a table that we designed for ourselves and we're fortunate to have it delivered right before the stay-at-home orders so, um it's an oak oak table with uh, very large legs <laughs> It's our dining table. We spent all nice. our time on. We spent all our time on this table. <laughs> in, in the lockdown. Yeah. Um, this one. This is a, a retail store in New York City, which um, it was under construction, and fortunately, we we almost finished it, and everything was kind of drywalled, and the lighting was on, and everything, and then. New York got locked down before the millwork could be delivered from Chicago. So we're still in a holding pattern, but we think um, it's going to wrap up soon where the, the millwork will ship from Chicago and get installed. Um, and to back up a little, it's a store called The Citizenry, and they're an, mainly an online retailer. And this would be their first bricks and mortar location. They sell. Um, sort of handcrafted goods from all over the world, um, like 
the rugs you see on the left and which are made in say Mexico or Africa and woven baskets and furniture and towels and different kind of home goods that are sourced from uh, smaller suppliers all over the world. Here's another, um, now this is a third landscape project, which is in the mountains um, in California, outside of Yosemite National Park. Uh, and it's like, a, it's like an area which has a lot of oak trees. Um, it's not pine trees anymore, it's a lot of oak trees. And uh, it's basically a hotel made out of little cabins. So we created, a, and um, as you can see in the section, it's on a slope with these oak trees all around. So um, the concept is to, to do a hotel that has a sort of a central uh, check-in area, but then all of the accommodations are prefabricated cabins set in the landscape. And so it's also a lot of mapping of where the oak trees are and where the views are and uh, finding these little plots uh, to, lo to uh, locate um, the cabins at. And then um, each cabin is <coughs> very small, just has like, the, it's basically a one room um, and then a little outdoor, private outdoor area. So, visual. so you, you can see how the cabins are staggered. So if you're in this cabin, you're sort of looking between other cabins and they're staggered in sections so that you, you can sort of look over and into the valley from one to another. But the emphasis is on kind of creating a little um, campsite at each cabin. So you have a solid wall and facing your outdoor area. So you kind of open up to your own little kind of outdoor area. And are those rooms, are they all fully prefabricated? Are they then brought in on the back of a truck or how prefabricated are they? Yes, they'd be 100% prefabricated. Um, uh, yeah, wrapped up on a on the back of a truck and then set on um, site built foundations. So the, the stilts here and, and some footings around the perimeter would be built on site and then these would come in on the truck and be bolted down. Mm -hmm. And they're I not shipping. Sorry. They're not shipping containers though, are they? No, they're not shipping containers. Um, one of the fabricators we're, we're looking at, we're, we're still considering a couple, but one of them is called Connect, Connect Homes um, out in San Bernardino County. And they, they, they have different models and this, this one would be based on their smallest kind of ADU model. But they're, they're built in a, a factory um, with a steel frame and then wood infill. And is that kind of construction technique quite common out in, in, in California? off-site manufacturing or things tend to be pretty much built on site still? It becomes, uh, uh, typically everything is built on site, but it's not uncommon. It get, gets much, um, I feel nobody, it's not, nobody would be surprised anymore to see a prefab homes and you see them around and it's, it's part of the industry now that it's not, common yet, but it's definitely part of the industry. And uh, it's not anything special anymore. Like, or something you have to, you basically, um, it's part of the industry and it's proven. And you can just uh, call them up and then they work with you, the, the different manufacturers. Yeah. So this is the... That's, that's the end of our presentation. Great, thank you, thank you very much. There's, um, I mean, a lot of the work that you've shown to, to uh, uh, someone who's not from California, it looks like classic California, like low rise houses, lots of outdoor space, pools, um, views of the mountains and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, 
how much though is Los Angeles changing? Because when I was there, I went to the Viper Room, and then just mm. afterwards, I heard, and, and all around that area of West Hollywood, there's increasingly tall buildings going up. And after I went to the Viper Room, that famous bar, I heard that there's a big plan to replace that low building with a with a big tower. Is is LA becoming a denser, higher rise? city and moving away from the kind of low density, low rise um, city that we all think of? I think in pockets it is, especially in say Koreatown is, um, you know, it was never super low rise, but it's getting many more taller buildings and downtown Los Angeles is getting a lot more tall buildings. Hollywood is getting a lot more tall buildings. Mm -hmm. So and Culver City is now getting taller buildings. So it's interesting that it happens mainly in pockets, but you still moving around Los Angeles. I think it hopefully will be a while before our low rise aesthetic is completely disappeared. And what about the, the traffic and the infrastructure? It's, um, it's, it's something that people from Europe always kind of we love everything about LA except the traffic. Are there any moves, are there any signs of um, ways of dealing with that, of decongesting the city, of, of pedestrianizing or encouraging cycling or anything like that? They, they, they installed one new train line, which is, I think, beneficial that it's called the Expo line. So it runs between downtown and Santa Monica. And that one, I think that's a great connection because it brings a lot of people to the beach and it passes through some lower income neighborhoods and, um, you know, it's a, it's a big investment. Um, it makes a great connection and it's just one connection. And I think we need a lot more of those if we're going to get out of our cars in any significant way. They also, there, there is actually a, I would say gradually a bike parking culture developing Los Angeles, which is really interesting. Um, and there are bicycle paths now. Um, for example, this Santa Monica Boulevard, we right here on, on the beginning of Santa Monica Boulevard, which goes all the way to the ocean, was four lane road, two lanes each direction. And they shut down one lane each direction and made it bicycle path. Uh, and it extends out in Sunset and like through other neighborhood streets. So, um, it, but it's still, I think, maybe this whole lockdown will change something because everybody, if there's one thing which everybody loves here is that they don't have to be in traffic right now, but they can just wake up and work <laughs> and, and be done with it. It's, uh, I have a feeling that the remote working culture might be big after this is all done, that you don't go to work every day anymore, but you work from home it might change a lot, but you'll see. But there are clearly some people in Los Angeles who enjoy using their motor vehicles because I heard some of them. There was like someone on a motorbike going past. <laughs> What's going on? Is there a racetrack outside your house or something? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, the weather is beautiful here now, so we have all the doors and windows open at the office and <clears throat> Santa Monica Boulevard is right behind this wall of books. So you're hearing some traffic uh, infrequently. I, I apologize for that. No, it's okay. It lets us know you're in, you're in the real world rather than a fantasy land. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, we are. It's like, uh, <clears throat> all the, yeah. Okay. It's funny. Jeffrey and Sylvia, it's been great to chat to you. Thanks so much for sharing your work and your enviable lifestyle and, and clients with us. And um, mm -hmm. I hope to see you in the real world before too long. Okay, thank you very much for the interview. Enjoyed it and for your questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, bye. Okay.